Hello, my name is Dara Miles Wilson. I am our communications coordinator for Appalachia Audubon. And I welcome you to our April program um, with Nicole Jackson as our speaker. So thank you all for coming. We are honored to have Nicole as our speaker and we are so grateful that you all decided to join us this evening. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are living on the stolen lands of the Muscogee Tribes Nation um, here in Tallahassee, Florida. And I would just like to pay homage to that. I would also like to acknowledge anyone who is grieving currently. Um, currently there over in uh, Minnesota, we are all as a nation witnessing the trial of or the murder trial from George Floyd last year. And I'd also like to acknowledge anyone who is grieving from Duante White. So um, we also, for Appalachia Audubon, have a few announcements. Um, first announcement is tomorrow, the Florida, um, Florida, Ornithological, excuse me, Florida Ornithological Society um, will be having a program. Um, and on Saturday, I believe they're having their spring, uh, spring series for conferences. Um, and our next program, for May is featuring Jeff Vandermeer. And we're super excited about that. His program is titled Nature as, Inspirating, as Inspiration for Writing, that and other thoughts. So please join us, um, please join us on May 20th. May 20th, same time, seven o'clock PM, third Thursday of the month. Um, and that is featuring Jeff Vandermeer. And if you haven't heard already, he just released a book, Hummingbird Salamander, which I am currently reading, it's pretty good. Uh, so please join us for that and check that book out if you can. So our speaker this month is Nicole Jackson. Now, Nicole, excuse me, I need to pull this up. Nicole, Nicole is a nature enthusiast. Uh, she is an avid bird watcher. She, um, she's an alumna of the School of the Environment and Natural Resources at The Ohio State University. There she earned her Bachelor of Science degree in environmental education and interpretation in 2011. Nicole is an environmental educator who has worked for various nonprofits, implementing programs across the past decade, gold, um, across the past decade in central Ohio, focused on conservation, gardening, green jobs, and outdoor recreation. Her main goal as an educator is to help people of color find access to local resources that connect them to find, um, to, excuse me, to fund nature experiences and become environmental stewards. Nicole is always looking for opportunities to learn something new and help others see the brilliance and lessons of the natural world around them. Some of her recent roles include natural leader of the Children and Nature Network a member of the National Parks Conservation Association's Next Generation Advisory Council, co-organizer of Black Birders Week, and founder of Black and National Parks Week. During this presentation, Nicole will highlight the work she's doing to inspire environmental educators and professionals to think outside of the box so they can create a more inclusive environment and better connect diverse audiences to the natural world around them. The title of this presentation is Fixing to Take Flight, Soaring Above the Limits. So please join me in welcoming Nicole Jackson, tonight's speaker. Nicole, you can take it away now. Hello. Um, thank you, Dara, for that introduction. I appreciate you. Um, and I also, as well, um, wanted to just quickly give a moment of silence um, to the family of Duante uh, Wright, as well as um, the family of George Floyd. Okay, so I um, am very excited to be a part of this evening's uh, program with the Appalachia uh, Audubon Society. And I was very um, excited to be invited um, to speak by Dara Wilson. Uh, she's a really good friend uh, that I've come to know 
uh, over the past year and we've connected in so many ways. And I just appreciate um, her passion and um, just really opening up herself to new experiences and um, just sharing just sharing herself and, and shining uh, brightest as anybody I think uh, would see and notice um, when they're with her. So I appreciate you again, Dara. Uh, so my name is Nicole Jackson. I uh, use she, her, her pronouns. And um, I am based in Columbus, Ohio, uh, but I am from Cleveland, Ohio. All my family is there. Um, and with that, I actually, um, spring is here and I am super, super excited that spring is here. Therefore, um, I've been getting prepped in, in many ways because of spring migration. So um, I, I wanted to start with a poem actually um, with this presentation because it is April and April is National Poetry Month. Um, and I actually wanted to read a poem by Langston Hughes called Earth Songs. I've just been feeling inspired by nature and its beauty um, and what it's provided for me up until this point, um, especially um, since the start of the, the pandemic. So I will start with that. Earth Song by Langston Hughes. An earth song, it's an earth song. And I've been waiting long for an earth song. It's a spring song. I've been waiting long for a spring song. Strong as the bursting of young buds strong as the shoots of a new plant, strong as the coming of the first child from its mother's womb. An earth song, a body song, a spring song, and I've been waiting long for an earth song. So my inspiration has always been through nature. And with that, I will start my presentation, my PowerPoint here. And um, Dara, please feel free to let me know if you're having issues with my audio again. Um, let's see if I can fix that if necessary. So a little about me, as I mentioned, I am uh, living in Columbus, Ohio, but I'm from Cleveland. Um, I give myself various different titles. Um, I'm not just uh, one thing, I don't represent one thing. I feel like I'm uh, a bunch of, uh, have a bunch of parts of myself um, in ways that I describe myself that make me feel uh, like who I'm supposed to be, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm an environmental educator and that's uh, my professional kind of background um, title. I'm a birder, I love birds um, and I've been doing that off and on for the past decade. Uh, I'm a nature enthusiast. Um, nature was uh, something I was drawn to since I was really young and um, continue to uh, try to find ways to um, be out in nature as much as I can and, and share that knowledge that I've learned over the years with others. I'm a park advocate. I love parks, um, neighborhood parks, pocket parks, city parks, national parks. Um, just because uh, those are places that are of value and each one is um, you know, kind of its own unique uh, green space and has um, really special things to offer, uh, whichever you decide to visit, whether you're near or far. Um, and I'm an ambivert, so I feel like I have a mixture of um, introvertedness and extrovertedness. Uh, I would lean more towards introvertedness, but um, I, I do get very much excited when <laughs> I'm wanting to connect with people and learn new things. So I'm just gonna move forward. There's a few pictures that I've been taking over the past few months since the beginning of 2021, um, just because I wanted to have an opportunity to capture the things that I was seeing in nature. Um, I've, I've been bird watching for a good chunk of time, uh, but I just recently in the beginning of January brought a camera um, to actually capture some of the things I've seen around where I live. And um, again, that's just a whole new vibe um, that I've, I've gotten of just being present 
um, and seeing how the, the natural world is still alive and, and buzzing. So this first picture uh, is a, of an, a bald eagle that I captured in February, I believe. Um, and it was a really cold day. Uh, the skies were clear and I was just doing a hike through um, a park uh, near where I live. And I was actually, I heard a hawk first. I think it was a red tail hawk. So I was, you know, trying really fast to find where that hawk was. And I actually saw it fly away. So I wasn't able to capture a picture of it. And then I heard another um, really loud call, crazy. It just sounded really crazy and chaotic. And then I look out the corner of my eye and I see this eagle. Um, so we have the Olentangy River and, and Columbus, um, and it's connected to trails throughout um, the city. And, you know, it's right along a trail along next to the, the river and just happened to just see it fly in. And it landed on this dead uh, stag and I was just floored. I was actually about to leave and head home and kind of gave up because I missed the hawk. But then the eagle showed up, which is even better. So I captured as many shots as I could, not really knowing what I got until I got home. And this was one of the awesome shots that came up. And the sky was just crystal clear. Like it's just, yeah, this couldn't have been um, a better moment for me to use my new camera. So I am very proud of this photo. Um, this was in, uh, I believe, um, March, towards the end of um, March. And I'm very much a fan of full moons. And this was the day of a full moon. Um, and as I was walking at one of the parks, I saw the um, great blue heron fly up in a tree. Um, so I decided again to pull out my camera. And this is when the sun was setting. Um, so I was kind of waiting for the moon to appear, and this was just an awesome chance for me to capture a shot of the great blue heron as the sun was setting. So um, it's pretty chill, didn't mind me, even though I was pretty close um, looking up in the tree. So I was glad it didn't fly away as soon as I made my rounds <laughs> around the trail to get to where the spot was. Um, and this picture came out really well. Uh, this was another shot at my uh, nearby neighborhood park, a uh, great egret um, fishing. Um, caught some fish and um, I was able to get some shots of it catching the fish, but I really like this one because it was just showing more of the feathers, uh, the plumage um, and this, the contrast of water and then the green and the orange on the beak, um, which is something I really like. so. And then this was a really awesome moment uh, back in a park that I hadn't been to, a city park. Um, North uh, of North Columbus. Um, and I was again doing another nature hike. By chance, out of the corner of my eye, I see uh, uh, the colors red, black, and, and white. And I instantly thought, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's a red headed woodpecker. So I had to stop and like not scream because <laughs> I didn't want to scare it away. Um, and noticed it uh, pecking at the tree. So again, this was an opportunity for me to like, just take a bunch of pictures as many as I could before it flew away. But it was a good 10 minutes that I was just getting multiple shots, which was awesome. Um, and this was my first time ever um, lifer. <laughs> um, and I actually don't like keep track of bird. Like I don't really have bird lists. Um, but I know what birds that I, I haven't seen like ever, and this was one of them and I just got really excited. Um, so yeah, this was definitely a treat. And then this was recently, like a few days ago, um, I was at the wetlands at the Ohio State and uh, OSU wetlands area. And um, I was finishing up a walk. Um, again, the sun was setting or about to set at least. And then all of a sudden I spooked this hawk um, and red shoulder, I believe. And, um, it just flew off into a grassy area and I followed it. And then I actually followed it. And then out of nowhere, it flew up into the trees again, but I totally missed that. It was trying to catch a squirrel. So there was a squirrel that it clipped, um, and it missed, and then it went up into the tree and that's how I got this shot.
Um, so that was a really cool 10 second experience um, and then it flew away. So um, growing up, oops, sorry. Uh, growing up in inner city, city Cleveland, um, I had a lot of siblings. I have 10 siblings, seven sisters and three brothers. Um, my, um, I kept to myself a lot and uh, with my siblings, it was, you know, we would have time where we would go outside and, and play um, and also uh, go to parks and um, hang out with friends and, you know, go to neighbor's houses and things like that. Um, but when I was out in nature, usually like when I'm wanting to spend time by myself, like I was usually by myself exploring um, in our backyard or, you know, off in a field looking at trees and flowers. Um, but TV was also an inspiration for me just because of the different types of TV shows um, that uh, reflected my interest. So there's PBS Nature, there's Kratz, uh, Kratz Brothers, um, Wishbone, because I loved reading. I loved going to the library. So this uh, picture at the bottom here um, is our Cleveland Public Library that I would go to um, near our school and read books about gardening and habitats and different types of wildlife and um, just learning and education was really, really fun. So I always wanted to just do a bunch of different things. Um, so, and, and having that opportunity to go to libraries and learn and read books and watch these different shows. Um, I actually started out wanting to become a, an animal doctor. Um, and then eventually that was something I didn't wanna do anymore. Um, just because it was just way too competitive for me. Um, and I don't see myself as a competitive person. Like I didn't want to feel like I was grinding myself um, into the ground to, to get a degree or to, you know, have a life that I wanted. I mean, that's cool for anybody else who's like very competitive, but I just had that feeling that it wasn't for me. And it was my first, second year of college and I didn't want to put that much pressure on myself. I still wanted time to explore um, other careers. Um, so with that, I had to find out, you know, what would be something else that I would be interested in. Um, my advisor at the time at The Ohio State University thought I might be interested in doing field research. Um, so I ended up connecting with her students, grad students, and they were working on um, landscape ecology and predation um, research uh, around Northern Cardinals and Acadian flycatchers. So in this picture, I was at one of the sites, park sites, um, holding an Acadian flycatcher. Um, and I think that was my first time holding um, a bird, but uh, just having that experience for a summer of three and a half months was, was amazing and it opened up a whole new world for me. Um, so that experience just added so many different things. Um, and, you know, it was very therapeutic, it was nurturing. You know, I, had to, I got to spend hours and hours of my time out in nature, um, researching and, and doing um, kind of, I mean, as far as like field research, you know, that was something I hadn't done or explored before. So it was just another uh, kind of window that was open for me and, and thinking about science and STEM related careers um, and even outdoor recreation. Uh, Cause a lot of these places were at city parks or, um, Metro parks in, in Columbus. And that helped me kind of create this mental map, this map of all of the parks um, within my community and, and how I could use those um, in the future. So I always find birds fascinating because they're unique. Uh, they don't really have limits um, just because they can fly <laughs> everywhere and you know, big or small. Um, they're adaptable, they're resilient, and they're cute. Um, so just knowing that there's so many different types of birds, you know, just be, even beyond Ohio is, is still very fascinating to me. And um, all of them are, are so um, unique and have their own kind of personalities and um, ways that, you know, they need to survive and uh, ways that they stand out. Um, so earlier on in my career, um, I eventually ended up uh, choosing environmental education. Um, so my first environmental education job was at the Grange Insurance Audubon Center um, here in Columbus, Ohio. And um, I was a summer camp counselor, but then also as part of um, 
my coursework, I learned that uh, it was an important bird area um, for bird conservation. And the site used to be an impound lot and they transformed it, um, remediated uh, the site and transformed it into this um, inner city green oasis, which I had no idea existed. So I got to work there and just be a part of that, um, kind of building that history of a green space um, was really fun. Um, so with that training, uh, leadership training that I was part of, part of with the Together Green Youth Fellowship um, team, um, I was able to go to West Virginia. This was actually my first time getting on a plane um, with a few friends uh, that I went to um, college with. And we did this leadership training around bird conservation and creating opportunities to do more of um, kind of the teaching within our communities to help people learn about their green spaces and, and bird conservation as a whole. Uh, so this is that group, which I was, I learned so much because they were all, you know, from across the United States um, as a part of that leadership program. And then as my career went on, I ended up doing more summer camps. So 4-H uh, after school programs um, and connecting youth to nature in the outdoors, um, recreation activities, nature related programs. So these are just some of the pictures I've taken over the, those years, you know, things I noticed. Um, these are at 4-H camp um, near where I lived, uh, about an hour away from Columbus, Licking County, I believe. Um, so these are just really cool shots that I got while I was doing my, my work um, as a, as a res residential uh, camp counselor. So there's a, a bat in the little crevice there and the uh, puffball, uh, imperial moth, uh, tree frog that just happened to just show up after a downpour of rain. Um, we went fishing with the kids. That was really cool. I think that was my first time actually like instructing kids um, how to fish and uh, release their catch. And then we got this cool orb weaver. Um, I'm not a fan of spiders, but um, I really enjoy um, their uniqueness with how they look. So like the color patterns, um, their size, how they build um, their webs. Uh, so we were actually releasing, um, catching and releasing frogs and this uh, orb weaver um, web got caught in the, the net. Uh, so before they put it back, um, gently put it back, uh, I was able to capture this picture. So this is another shot um, that I wasn't expecting, but just these, these things just happen and I embrace it. So I try to capture these moments as much as I can. Um, there's a hidden thing in, in this picture. I don't know if you all see it, but close up, this is what it is. <laughs> And again, it was a really cute frog. Just another um, nature walk that I took at one of our um, city parks. I think it's a metro park. Um, and then this was actually on Ohio State campus. I was on a phone call, like a meeting phone call outside, walking around, talking. And I happened to see this praying mantis. Um, I didn't realize it was a praying mantis. And then I saw the wings and like it was doing the, you know, with its uh, front uh, claws, <laughs> just like moving. So I just decided uh, to get a picture and this is how the photo came out, which I very much, again, am very proud of. Um, a lot of these moments are unexpected, but I kind of zone in on the thing that I'm looking at or that I'm intrigued by. And, and try to get a momentous kind of shot, um, inspiring shot of it. And this is just nature, anything nature, not just birds um, that inspires me. Um, so this was actually uh, my birthday last year. Um, I was having a hard time finding my way back to nature, not feeling you know as happy and excited just because stuff with pandemic and um, wanting to stay safe and, and healthy, um, but I decided to go out for my birthday. Um, again, back on the trail, um, 
and, and just celebrate, you know, still being here, um, still feeling healthy and not um, kind of restricting myself um, from, from connecting to nature still. So I'm gonna play a little bit of this of my birthday um, nature walk. Hi everybody. It's Nicole and it's my birthday. Woo woo. All right, so my heart just stopped, like literally just stopped. I'm at Tuttle Park and I'm already confused because I'm like, there's just tree, litter, debris. Sorry, is that still, sorry, uh, Dara? Everywhere, and I forgot we've had- I think it's still playing. Okay, crazy rain <laughs> and um, thunderstorms, I guess. Um, so the water's gotten pretty high and onto the trail. Um, uh, hi, Hannah. Um, so I'm still trying to figure out where to walk because it's really muddy and I slipped a few times. Oh my goodness. It's like, you, I'm, I'm sure you hear all the birds. I'm so excited, but I'm literally walking on the trail and this is who I spot on the trail, like right in front of me, still looking at me. Hold on, let me. <laughs> Look at this little guy. Look at that. You are gorgeous. And you didn't fly away. Thank you. I love you. This is a, the best birthday nature gift I can get right now. Sorry, I'm shaking. <laughs> but he's like right on the trail, just chilling. Oh my goodness. Barred owl. Barred owl. So, if anybody's watching this right now, you're welcome. <laughs> There is a barred owl on the, off the trail here. Oh my goodness. I am just thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly excited. Hopefully nobody's coming through with any dogs. Um, that's my gift for today. I don't want to get too close. Okay, so. <laughs> Um, I hope you all heard that. Um, okay, I'm, I'm assuming that was heard. Um, oh, thanks <laughs> for mentioning that because I wasn't sure with the chat. Um, so yeah, that was my birthday gift. I wasn't expecting that, <laughs> but it was awesome. Um, and then I eventually ended up running into someone like on the trail. So they were like, what are you looking at? And I was like, oh my goodness, there's this part owl. So they freaked out with me. Um, and then I actually ended up going back because I was still giddy uh, to capture another shot of the, the barred owl. And this was after a really crazy storm. So there's just muddy and twigs and um, uh, tree branches and all that stuff everywhere. So I was trying to tread lightly on the trail and then, you know, as I'm walking I just out of nowhere, I'm like, oh, there's the <laughs> barred owl, expecting it to fly away, but it's just there, chill, just hanging out. So fun, fun, fun experience. I, I remember that so vividly. All right, let's continue on here. Um, so with the Children in Nature Network, um, I ended up doing, uh, leadership training in Washington um, state. Uh, so with the Children in Nature Network, I became a natural leader um, in 2013. So again, another opportunity to um, train with other young professionals uh, who are interested in the environment and, and inspiring their communities to uh, connect children, youth and families to nature and the outdoors. Um, so I was part of that. Um, I was able to take that knowledge um, and training with me back to Columbus and do some uh, neighborhood nature programs. Uh, so it started out as um, let's go get outside and then eventually transformed into learn your park, uh, learn your park CBUS. Um, 
So I ended up doing that for four years, um, different city parks, and really helping people focus on um, the nature in their city parks and the value that nature has to offer. And, you know, a lot of people, especially with geese, people are annoyed by geese, um, but they're part of any other, you know, natural system, um, you know, they're producing, they're looking for food, um, they have a natural habitat, all of those things. So that was part of um, some of my education, but then also bringing community um, organizations uh, that were interested in, in making these connections and building community as well. So organizations that focus on health and wellness. Um, and the picture with the guy in the glasses, that's George, who works at the Black, um, not Black Swamp, Oh my goodness, I'm blanking on the oh, Ohio Wildlife Center, sorry. <laughs> Ohio Wildlife Center, and um, he talked about uh, the rehab center and the native um, animals that aren't able to be released back into the wild. So the red-tailed hawk was one of those. Um, we also had, um, I think a woodchuck, I think was the, it had some uh, neurological issues, uh, but the kids got to learn about you know their natural habitat. Like if you were to see one, in the wild, like these are the things that it eats, um, where it lives, um, things like that. And then um, other organizations that focused on um, outdoor play, conservation. So bringing them all together to see um, how we can just, you know, focus on collaborations of partnerships when it came to the environment and better supporting it. Um, I also attended conferences, uh, so environmental education conference, the national one. Uh, my first one is in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, back in 2013. This was an awesome opportunity for me to learn more about um, um, other organizations uh, that focus on environmental education, um, also research. So, you know, working with different universities, uh, students that were getting their master's or PhD, um, degrees and environmental programs, uh, environmental justice, social justice, environmental science. Um, and then I was able to meet my good friend, Rodney Stotts, who's a black falconer um, in the DMV area. And um, during one of the program sessions, I got to hold one of his, um, I think it was, a, I think if I'm remembering this correctly, it was a Saudi, Arab Saudi Arabian falcon, um, but I'm, I'm not remembering if that was correct or not but I got to hold it. Um, I'm forgetting his name. I think his name was James. Um, got to hold him for a little bit and then fed him uh, a frozen rat, <laughs> frozen mouse, <laughs> which was interesting. Um, so yeah, that was fun to be able to meet him and learn about his program and the stuff that he does, uh, his work um, connecting youth to uh, nature opportunities. All right. And then there's the National Parks Conservation Association, um, who I'm still currently with. Uh, so a lot of my work with them revolves around the um, protection of our national parks for future generations. Um, so I've been to a few national parks uh, being a part of this council. Um, and there's 16 of us across the United States. Um, and it's a really awesome group um, that I really love and admire. I'm learning stuff all the time from the council members and uh, just about our national park system history, you know, and there's definitely a focus on conservation and how climate change is even impacting, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, bird populations in national parks, um, which is something I'm very passionate about. So advocacy is another part of my work, uh, which I'm very proud of, and hopefully um, I can continue that for as long as I can and uh, inspire others to do the same. So finally, <laughs> um, there's Black Birders Week that was created uh, back in June of 2020 as a result of a Christian Cooper um, incident that happened in Central Park. Um, so the event was created in 48 hours um, and we ended up having that for the full week uh, to inspire uh, people online and provide a platform. Um, I was one of the co-organizers um, to share their experiences um, around barriers and obstacles that we face um, as uh, bird watchers, um, STEM educators, ornithologists um, of color, um, as we try to do this work, as we try to enjoy ourselves in the outdoors. Um, so the goals, um, as you see, were key and important, but also finding a way um, to be of support, to be a resource uh, for people 
of color, um, specifically black people that were interested in connecting um, to nature and finding opportunities to kind of build their bird knowledge um, and connect with other uh, black birders. So again, this was part of the social media engagement. So there was talks, um, there was discussions, uh, there were panels, uh, there were activities, um, ways to share your experiences online with photos, um, stories, posts, all of that um, as the week went on. And then I, a big part of this was representation again. Um, and this is um, stuff that happened way before these pictures um, of events that happened way before Black Birders Week that I've been a part of. Uh, so I got to meet uh, Drew Lanham at an environmental education conference um, for the first time and um, just learn about his, his work, his writing, um, you know, him being a, a conservationist, like all of these different things that I wouldn't ever think that I would hear from a person that looks like me um, is something, yeah, just so inspiring by that. So to be able to have conversations with him about my concerns around bird watching or even becoming, um, kind of advancing my career with environmental education and just wanting to be more of a resource and, and learn more um, from the people that came before me, but then like really growing those group of, of people um, and leaders. Um, so I got to bird watch with him and, and Douglas, who's um, in Indiana, um, at the biggest week in American birding, uh, which is an awesome festival that happens every year in May um, in Toledo, Ohio. I've been there a few times uh, with the Ornithology, OSU Ornithology Club um, at the Ohio State University. I'm actually wearing my <laughs> ornithology hoodie, uh, OSU Ornithology Club hoodie with our warblers that are doing the OHIO um, symbol. So, and my favorite color is blue. So, um, I'm glad to be wearing this and supporting that uh, student club and um, any other things that are happening uh, in our community. So um, I'm, I'm just really, I was just really excited to be able to meet people that had just as much of an interest and passion and birds and the environment in general as I did. Um, and they look like me and we can share stories and we can, um, talk about, you know, concerns that we have, um, barriers that we still have to, you know, try to overcome. And then also like just being inspired by each other. I think it was just an awesome, you know, that's grown tremendously. Um, and even with Black Birders Week to be able to meet so many other people online um, that weren't sure, you know, if they were considered a birder. Um, but they're like, yeah, I've seen these birds before. I really like them. Then in my, my eyes are a birder. Um, but then knowing that there's different levels and that, you know, you can learn um, and grow and build yourself. Um, so we're all starting somewhere, um, but wanting to grow and, and learn more. So just letting them know that they can do that um, and they can be empowered and, and motivated um, by just sharing their stories. So a part of uh, the Black Birders Week, uh, some of the other group members um, are um, Alex Troutman, uh, Karina Newsom, and my good friend Taiki, um, who's from Philly, but he lives in DC and he does a lot of advocacy work um, with National Audubon Society that focuses on um, uh, working with um, politicians to get them interested in you know, creating more policy to protect uh, birds. Um, and I just like to bird with him. He's a really cool down to earth guy. So, um, I'm happy that I got to meet him a few years ago in person. Um, so some resources that I've used over the years of being an environmental educator, um, that really have given me perspective and, and continuing the work that I do. Um, these are just some books, uh, that I've collected over the years, uh, black faces and white spaces. Um, reclaiming the Relationship of African Americans of the Outdoors uh, by Dr. Carolyn Finney. Uh, she's a great author. Um, and just seeing this book, I think, really helped me put things in perspective of this is an on, there's an ongoing issue with 
um, representation in the outdoors, but then there's also the history tied to it that we, um, as, excuse me, as uh, Black people don't even know about. Um, so having that um, kind of be written on paper and seeing how our history um, ties to the transformation of the environment and, and our, um, how we take action um, is really eye-opening. And then there's uh, John C. Robinson, who wrote Birding uh, for Everyone, Encouraging People of Color to Become Bird Watchers. He is in California, um, and he's been doing this work for decades. He's a, he's a um, ornithologist, uh, researcher, um, public speaker, like just, know, just getting to know him over the past um, year or so has been inspiring just because of his knowledge and wanting to connect youth uh, specifically to these opportunities. Um, there's Trace by Lorette Savoy. Um, Lorette Savoy also did Colors of Nature, uh, J. Drew Lanham, um, The Home Place. He has uh, recently released another new book um, about sparrows, I believe. Um, I'm not remembering the name. Um, and then, uh, Black and Brown Faces in America's Wild Places, um, Dudley Edmondson, who's in Minnesota, Duluth, Minnesota. He's actually from Columbus, I believe, Columbus, Ohio. Um, I got to meet him as well, and he's really awesome. Um, again, a person just sharing more of these stories and highlighting people of color um, about their interests in, in leadership and um, representation in the great outdoors. So with that, <laughs> I'm gonna wrap up and stop talking. <laughs> um, if anybody has any uh, questions for me, I know the chat is filling up. So um, here's my contact information. If you wanna reach out, it's my email, uh, nikkij08 at gmail.com. And then if you wanna reach out on social media, these are my social media handles. Um, I did not mention anything about Black and National Parks Week just because that's a whole other thing, but uh, Black and National Parks Week is something I created back in August of 2020 that focuses on um, the history um, and stories, narratives of the Black experience in our national parks and how um, uh, African Americans have transformed uh, the landscape of, uh, I guess, the, the start, the creation of our national parks. So just sharing more of those narratives and stories and experiences. Um, if you want to know more about that, please reach out to me by email or on social media. So yeah, I'm going to wrap that up. Sarah, if you want to. <laughs> All right. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Never stop talking. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was, that was beautiful. And that was touching. I'm <laughs> thank you um so much uh that was that was incredible right, so thank i'm gonna you. is it okay if i stop share um yes you can stop share okay can... i just want to make sure i'm paying attention to the chat <laughs> thank you so yes yeah, so let's let's go through some questions we have we have a few questions so um so well first off uh we have questions in the chat questions in the q a um i want to we have some time but got we have ample time. So yes, uh, first off, I've always wondered this myself because you've been taking, I've been looking at your journey as a photographer for a while and you've been getting better and better. I am really proud. Yes. So what kind of camera are you using? So I got to because I have no idea what cameras <laughs> like. I just knew I wanted to take pictures and then like how I need to think about a budget. Um, and I knew Nikon was on my list um, just from other friends that have used it. Uh, so I ended up getting uh, a Nikon Coolpix 950 at Best Buy. Um, it was within my price range, so I didn't want to overdo it with having to get um, a separate camera and then the lens um, and, and having to pay more. So, and I was just starting. Um, I mean, I've taken a bunch of pictures throughout my life of nature moments um, on my camera or on my phone camera, but not like officially like I have my own like, you know, fancier uh, camera to do that. So that was literally just this year. <laughs> so because I had that experience, and this is the thing with nature and my pictures, 
like that's something I very much appreciate with building my relationship in nature because it's taught me to be more in tune with the presence of nature and like being patient, being still listening, watching, observing. And then I just apply all of that to how I take pictures now. So, you know, with the redheaded woodpecker, it was literally like, don't scream, but then also (laughs) stay still, kind of keep my distance. But then, you know, the having that shot um, and capturing the redhead um, and even some, uh, some other movements, like it was stretching its wings and it wasn't just like, you know, click, 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 click. Like I would wait for a moment, snap, wait for a moment and then snap. That's so true. That's so true. And yeah, also that, that eagle, that bald eagle is gorgeous. I know. Gorgeous. Right. It's so every time you look at it, I'm just like, I took that photo. I'm so I'm proud so of myself. Shocked. Yeah. You have the technique. You have the technique. Okay. Um, so Jackie, Jackie Sulak asks, did your parents ever encourage you to go outside or was this something that you discovered on your own? yes because my mom had so many kids she got tired of us so go outside (laughs) and play yes (laughs) um but she didn't encourage me to go out in nature it was just more of like you know I I need a minute (laughs) from all of you um so just go play you know with your siblings go play with your friends um and I will let you know when it's time to eat pretty much um but when it came to nature um essentially I was I already had a relationship with nature before. Um, I don't know. There's okay. So there's a point in time where I was in foster care. I was maybe five or six years old. And unfortunately I was sexually abused um, when I was in foster care. So nature was my go-to therapy. Um, And I didn't know this at the time, but like, I felt safe outside. I felt safe, um, you know, going and sitting under trees or like, laying in the grass or, you know, picking, I remember the grape, uh, grapevine, um, in the backyard of, uh, my foster parents, um, uh, house. And, uh, there was grapes growing everywhere in this grapevine. So I remember picking those, like, and that was calming. Like that was a place for me to just be by myself and not have to think about, you know, the abuse and like feeling scared or worried, um, so I've always felt safe outdoors. And that was just something that naturally um, built more and more over time. And then I started out as therapy and then eventually uh, into education of just, you know, what are these things out in nature that I'm seeing all the time? So the plants, the wildlife um, and how everything just works together um, to continue um, to, to thrive. When did you when did you begin to see nature as therapy? It was literally just from, and I don't have, like, there isn't like an exact moment that I'm just like, oh, this is, but it was more of just being at peace and not having those thoughts of when the next incident would happen to me. Right. Um, my sister, I was with, I was with an older sister um, in foster care. So we were together and we had it, I mean, pretty much leaned on each other. Um, but that was my go-to was, was nature in the outdoors. So a lot of the times I spent outside were by myself. I wasn't trusting of people. Um, I didn't want to open up. I didn't want to talk, um, and just be vulnerable. Uh, so in my mind, I could have a relationship with nature and like talk to nature as if it was like a person that, you know, I want it to be in my life that wasn't going to like hurt me or like, you know, um, so yeah, it was pretty much, you know, just that feeling of, okay, if I, if I am having a hard day or I'm, you know, just feeling scared or any of that stuff, I would just go outside and, you know, smell a a flower or sit in the grass and just kind of tune out, you know, from reality, from what I was actually having to deal with on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, I can empathize with that. I, I, I garden barefoot because there's, there's something about like really feeling. And it made me more present, even though exactly. I was going through trauma, like it was a traumatic situation. I, you know, I could feel things, touch things in a way that was so profound of like, okay, nature is alive. I'm alive. 
I should be here. I should be able to enjoy these things. I shouldn't have to have these feelings of um, uncertainty, of fear. Um, and um, I guess this uh, disconnection from myself even of, you know, kind of like an out of body experience. So I was very much, yeah, nature just showed up in so many ways um, that I wasn't expecting. I'm glad. Okay. Um questions uh so we have a columbus mm -hmm. columbus native here uh mm -hmm. ooh, um let me see so good to see that <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> representation what do you wish people knew about nature of that area that people down here in florida uh the panhandle may not realize um notice about columbus like ohio nature mm -hmm. i mean it's <sighs> I mean, it can be just as hot and humid, um, <laughs> but I think, I mean, I want to say just the pocket parks and I, and I'm, and I'm speaking, like, I see this from different perspectives because I appreciate pocket parks so much more now <laughs> because, you know, going through the pandemic, everybody's just like feeling cooped up and um, wanting to go places further away. So it's like most, most of Ohio is agricultural land. So, um, when you go further south, it's a little bit more hill, hilly, but at the same time, it's it's like knowing that you can go to like these different habitats within a small range and, and find all these different types of birds, like Sayota Audubon, which is where my first environmental education job was, just the variety there. Like you have the, um, the rivers, you have um, the woody areas, uh, forested areas with the the metro parks and just knowing that you have that variety um from those different habitats is like inspiring to me and knowing that you can go to like your city parks and you know you don't have to travel far away to see warblers even like people don't know that you have warblers in your um dogwood trees like <laughs> and they're literally like right they're like what do you mean warblers i'm like there's i will literally do a nature hike through the neighborhood and find like 30 species of warblers. So I don't even have to necessarily go to a park, but just knowing because of the variety of plant life um, in some people's yards, even in, in their gardens, what brings, you know, what birds show up is, is pretty cool. Thank you. Thank you for putting that plug for plants because we, we love to preach. Um, if you plant them, they yeah. will come. Yes. So, I'm and that serious. includes dandelions. So stop, stop getting rid of the dandelions. They're the birds need the dandelion seeds. <laughs> also, we like to plant that, like you know, like responsible mowing. We, mm -hmm. you're just putting all the right plugs in. But yes. <laughs> By the way, that was from uh, our board member, um, past president board member Peter Kleinhens, uh, awesome. who's a huge snake um, fanatic. So if you ever cool, want to cool. connect with a. Uh, Peter, whenever he goes back home to Ohio, you know, we, we can make that happen. So um, next we have from also board member, uh, Nelson, Nicole, thank you for speaking to us. With all of your experience working with and staffing, uh, starting different organizations, have you ever found certain methods of outreach to be more effective than others? Thank you, Nelson. Um, I, for me, it's, it's always storytelling, like just getting to know someone and their interests um really sticks with me you know there's certain things where someone will have a conversation with me and not even to say like with birding like you need to go bird watching like because it's awesome in these ways because not everybody's going to click or relate to it in that way um but just you know i've had instances where i meet someone they seem pretty cool with the work they do and they might like you know computers <laughs> but they're looking for more ways to you know find stress-free um activities or ways to you know release or reduce their stress um speaking of tomorrow is stress awareness day so um <laughs> um and i think that's just op opens up dialogue or at least a conversation for me to invite them um to do a walk with me at a local park and then from there i'm building um that relationship with, you know, the nature that I'm witnessing and the things that I see and sharing that, those stories, information. And, you know, sometimes because I'm so excited and enthusiastic during that walk, 
they're, they're seeing that and it's kind of contagious. So they're just like, oh my goodness, you you get so excited about birds. What is it about birds? Like, is there something I'm missing? Um, and then other times I'm not mentioning anything necessarily about going bird watching, but I'll, you know, you're gonna see robins or, or the geese, you know, certain little tidbits here and there. And then, you know, a week later they'll say, hey, I saw this bird while I was driving and it made me think of you. Like that still counts as <laughs> connecting and um, making that, I guess, moment stick. Um, so I've had a lot of people just reach out to me just because they've seen an article or um, seen a video or um, like a webinar and just really wanna connect with me in that way and kind of just work together and collaborate on ideas of how we can better bring those pieces together with different events, different programs, talks even, sometimes just presentations um, are helpful um, and learning someone else's story, you know, just like mine of how did that person get into bird watching or environmental education? And that just sparks so many oppor more opportunities to uh, connect and just kind of think off the cuff of, you know, I'm, I'm a, very much interested in sharing information and just creating things out of nothing. Um, so I feel like if we have more people like that in the world and um, especially connecting with youth, I think there's, again, just so many um, opportunities that can be created from that. Hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> I think that very thoroughly does, yes. Um, let me see. Uh, the, the, we have another question that I can answer on, on my own. Um, are any of your siblings also naturalist? No, I'm pretty much the only one in my family who's really invested, who's been we'll invested for this long. We will <laughs> so, get them there. But they do appreciate that I like to go out in nature with them when I visit. Like I'll always, you know, let's go to a park. Um, whether, you know, they want to just play, run around. Um, I've, I've taken my aunt a lot. She's really like invested now in doing nature hikes, um, as well as learning more about birds. So I've been talking to her more about, you know, getting bird feeders and, um, the types of birds that can show up uh, throughout the year. So that's really exciting. I like that. <laughs> Good. Yes. Enthusiasm is infectious. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, do you have any quick tips that can help us make sure that nature hikes are engaging for our kids? Don't make it a, um, don't make it like a program, make it an experience. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, it's, it sounds very basic. It sounds very simple, but we, a lot of the times as educators, we go in like, this outcome, this agenda, like there's metrics and like, I've done informal education, environmental education, and I've seen, you know, just having it too structured um, really prevents that like natural curiosity from really like lighting up and firing off. Um, and then learning, I think we have opportunities to learn from the kids too, and like what they see and how they see and how they process the natural world around them because a lot of the times we're in adult mode <laughs> so it's like it's okay to be in a kid in kid mode with them um without having that structure and you know you can you can have the guidance and you know some structure here and there but i think opening up to that natural curiosity and some people are seeing those things for the first time you might have seen a robin a million times but then you have someone who's just like what is that bird and <laughs> You know, it's making this uh, beautiful, it's, it's doing this beautiful song. Like there's just so many questions where it's just like, oh, that's just, that's just a Robin. But then you're taking away that new experience from someone who's experienced it for, for the first time. So, yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we're, we're at eight o'clock, but, but we have some really good questions. I can keep questions. going. I, I know you, and we have some <laughs> really good questions that I, I want to, I really want to answer. So let's, we're going to fly through these and I hope everybody can stay on. I, I really want to answer all these questions. Um, okay, so um, let me see. Um, what could communities do to enhance um, environmental education opportunities for kids that may have limited exposure to nature? I would start with um, books. So I know libraries are a part, like that was a part of my growing up. I mean, I, and things are so different now because of the pandemic. So I feel like there's still opportunities to engage 
with um, educators. So I feel like librarians are on that list. Um, now that we're using a lot of social media, there's virtual learning. So if there's opportunities, you know, even with national parks, they're doing virtual programs now, um, virtual tours of the national parks if you can't get to one. Um, podcasts, I know they have podcasts for everything now. Um, videos, YouTube, Google, all of that stuff. And I feel like you're kind of like building up your knowledge in a way that's helpful for you, but then also kind of staying in tune with the next generation. So it doesn't feel like, well, you have to learn in this way, um, but adding that variety of um, technology, I think uh, for me, and it's different now because growing up, it was more of, I would have a question <laughs> about nature and then I would just go to the library and ask the librarian like, hey, are there any books on this specific thing? Um, now that we're using social media, it's, um, you know, there's clubs, there's Facebook groups, there's uh, Twitter hashtags. Um, and I have a bunch of people that I always go to when I'm not sure about something, whether it be online, a phone call, um, and they have recommendations or resource, uh, resources that I can use um, that I haven't thought of. Um, so definitely tune in more online. Um, online can be, I mean, as, as far as social, um, from a social context, it can be very overwhelming and stressful, but there are so many different online communities that are so helpful with information and, and connecting and um, having those conversations together online really helps create more light <laughs> versus, you know, just it's a lost cause. Like don't shut it out completely. Thank you. Good. Yes. And on, on that note, um, on lost causes. Um, <laughs> so you were able to find nature. Um, is it possible or how do you think it's possible to encourage someone or like a child maybe to explore nature? Um, and if like, what do you suggest? How, how can you encourage someone? Those may be lost causes or how what someone would call a lost cause. You, I think you have to be repetitive, um, repetitive and consistent in, and I'm not sure if this person's referring to like the traditional way we've been doing things of like taking kids out or youth out, but like, I'm okay with one-on-one -on -one or, you know, groups less than 10. Like, I feel it's like, it's a more intimate way of connecting. Um, but again, like not having an expectation when you do, if you are to take them outside into nature and see how they respond to it, but then take them back to that place again or a different spot and see how they react, how they respond. Um, have a conversation that has nothing to do with nature and see, you know, is this person anxious? Do they need to be in another, uh, another place? Like I, I, and these are things that I noticed when I would go outdoors of like, okay, is this space, this green space keeping me calm? Is it making me anxious? Is it helping me want to learn more? Um, and then seeing other people enjoy nature in the outdoors and not seeing it as the scary thing oh my goodness, that does wonders. <laughs> I've been with so many people who are just like, yeah, I can't do the nature thing. So I'm just like, well, I don't want to be a part of it either if you're reacting to it in this way. <laughs> Got it. Okay. All right. And uh, let's go with, oh God, the last two questions. Um, that was my phone. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. One more question. Um, and thank you for everybody who's hung on with us for this song. And we're five minutes over. Um, over. Um, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure, uh, Nicole, you've done the biggest work, the biggest week in birding in Ohio, correct? Yes. So mm -hmm. no need to ask that question. I'm more than positive. In fact, I think I saw you just post about that. Yes. Um, I don't know how many times I've been. I'm going to say maybe five times. Um, but my very first time is with the OSU Ornithology Club. Yes. So, um, um, I, I would like you, uh, all right, so last question. I would like you, because I know your current work involves this a lot. Um, could you please speak for um, the outdoor spaces as refuge, um, refuges? Um, how has your work included play um, or outdoor therapy? As, um, and yeah, as a, just actually the outdoors, um, can you speak to the outdoors as a safe haven for 
you know, just our mental, just like how, you know, just medicine. Yeah. Mental so medicine. nature definitely, again, it resets the craziness <laughs> that goes on in the world. At least resets your, your body. So there's the emotional, there's the physical, a lot of the physical we talk about, but with the mental and emotional, we don't really dig deep um, with how nature impacts um, and benefits those parts of us. So I think for me, it was more of um, uh, less, you know, not having uh, high blood pressure, but then also having time to reflect and even daydream. Like I take nature naps, which are amazing. <laughs> um, to just be able to sit and even walk like and kind of tune like tune out the noise the hustle and bustle from your day of just like having a schedule or like I have to go to this meeting I have to be um doing a zoom thing you know at this time like really being focused and present does like wonders and then I'm not even thinking about the the chaos of the day anymore like I'm more clear-headed um I feel more productive because I gave myself that time and space to be present in nature and to um, be present in nature and be present with nature. So like, you know, look, using my senses, smell, sight, hearing, and like being more mindful and intentional with how I show up in those spaces um, and then letting others see the impacts of that. So even though I'm most, you know, most of the time by myself, um, there are people who do see me out outdoors and they see, you know, I'm really happy, enthusiastic and, um, just more cheery about myself. And it's helped me really figure out who I am as a person and who I want to be moving forward and just, you know, being more patient, compassionate with myself and, and knowing that nature is always going to be there if I need it. Yeah. No, no black trauma, no black pain. Thank right. you. And it's very, and it supports those joyful moments because I can have those anytime I want in, in nature. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Nicole, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your wisdom, for your expertise. Thank you for the joy that you bring to the world, to this field. I am so honored to have met you. I am so honored that you have graced the audience with this beautiful program. Thank you audience for being here with us today. Um, is there anything else that you can leave us with? So I'm looking at this, I'm sorry, I'm looking at these other questions. <laughs> so someone mentioned, someone mentioned the person that I mentioned, Taiki James. Um, oh, I can, the national, that's my mom. Yeah. I was gonna answer um, her later. I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry, I got excited because I'm like, I know Taiki, he's really cool. Um, so, continue <laughs> to find ways um, to get outdoors, to get outside um, and really embrace um, what nature has to offer. So I feel like in terms of it being, it's, it's therapy, it's education, it's wisdom, um, it's knowledge, it's um, compassion, it's empathy. I feel like nature has given me uh, so many opportunities to, to learn more about myself, like as an individual, but then also how to, you know, the, the connection with nature itself, like it being this uh, network and how we can replicate that as human beings um, because there's strength in support systems, there's strength in networks and really focusing on taking better care of yourself, but then also, um, finding ways to build community uh, through those experiences. So that's what I will leave you all with. Well, then that's it. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, I'd also like to thank my mentee through the Audubon Florida Conservation Leadership Institute, uh, Tulula. Thank you Tulula for being here and for, um, uh, Tulula, can Tulula unmute yourself please? Yes, Tulula, thank you so much for also being here. We um, we're so grateful to have you all and please have a wonderful evening. Have a good one. Thank you.